right. I am here with Brent Bailey, who is giving our next talk, Space, Time, Rules, and Rooms, How Games Create Narrative Out of Space. Brent is a programmer, researcher, and artist based in Brooklyn, New York. He works with all things computational, but is especially interested in games, narrative, and other ways of modeling the world. And I will now turn over the stream to you. Brent, take it away. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Brent. And for the next 10 or so minutes, I'm going to try and cram in a ton of my findings over the course of trying and mostly failing to combine 20th century Russian literary theory and text adventure games. Uh, to briefly self-promote, I'll just say that this talk comes out of research I did in making my own text adventure, a proper narrative. It's still very much a prototype, but you can play it at the link here and read a longer paper that I distilled this talk from. So now that that's done, let's talk about theory. I'm going to talk about text adventures, narrative games, and all the subjects near and dear to your hearts. But before I get to all of that, I'm going to talk a little about someone who I think is less likely to come up in other talks this week, Vladimir Prop. Prop was a Russian folklorist who's best known for his first book, 1928's Morphology of the Folktale. The book takes the linguistic structuralist concept of morphemes, analyzable linguistic units that hold meaning but can't be reduced into smaller meaningful parts like the word man or the suffix ed, and then it applies those to narrative. The book came out of Prop's studies on Russian folktales. As he went through these stories, he began to notice patterns, first in a series about persecuted stepdaughters. In one, Father Frost, a stepmother, sends her stepdaughter out into the woods to freeze to death, where the monster Father Frost threatens to kill her, but she then charms him into letting her go. In another popular tale, Father Frost was swapped out for a wood goblin, in another, a bear, and so on. The endings and characters of these stories would vary, but the structure was basically the same. And over the course of his research, Prop determined that this was the case not only for persecuted stepdaughters, but for all sorts of tales. These stories can be broken down into a set of functions, like the drastically simplified ones listed here. In his book, he detailed a set of 31 of these functions, or narratives. These are the basic units of a story, as morphemes are the basic units of language. Each of over 600 folktales Prop studied could be reduced, in terms of actions, to some combination of those 31 functions. Importantly, Prop's system of narratives was always chronological. Not every story contains every function, but they always occur in their numbered order. I won't subject you to all 31, but a few of them are above, and in terms of chronology, that should be fairly obvious. Absentation occurs before departure, which occurs before return. Even a brief look through these makes it clear that Prop was onto something. These narratives are applicable not only to Russian folktales, but to stories told all over the world. Prop took a while to catch on. The book wasn't published in English until 1958, but it became wildly influential in the following years. So with that background established, let's jump forward in time a bit. In 1975, 15 years after Prop's work broke through in the West, another world-changing innovation was taking place relatively unnoticed. Will Crowther, one of the developers of ARPANET, was going through a divorce. He was an avid spelunker and had loved mapping cave systems with his wife before they split. Lonely in her absence, he spent a few weekends putting together a text-based simulation of the process of exploring a cave, adding in a few fantasy elements inspired by his experiences playing Dungeons and Dragons. He later said that he built it in part as a way to remember his experience caving with his wife, and in part as something just fun for his children. He called this adventure. After he wrote this game, Crowther shared it with his coworkers and then went on a month's vacation. During that time, the game spread across the ARPANET like wildfire. Though its mechanic was based on the process of mapping a cave, it took off with programmers, people who tend to not even care for going outside. The joy wasn't in caving, but in puzzling your way through a coherent, but rigid system. Like Vladimir Prop, uh, Crowther didn't know this yet, but he had changed the world. Adventure, which was later adapted by Don Woods into Colossal Cave Adventure, was the first text adventure game ever made. It paved the way first for the rise of other text adventures in interactive fiction, and then later for narrative video games, interactive films, and more. So all of this is traceable back to a single lonely guy writing a program in his spare time to connect with his kids and remember his failed marriage. A lonely guy writing a cave mapping simulator may seem to have very little to do with Vladimir Prop at first glance, but if we want to treat games as narratives and as cultural artifacts, it seems valuable to look at it through Prop's lens. Adventure feels like a narrative, even if it's a sparse one. And even if adventure is just barely a story, its descendants certainly seem to be stories. Even Super Mario follows a sequence of Propian functions. But there is a fundamental tension here. 
The structure of an interactive game isn't a story. It's a map ever since Will Crowther made his first map. Whether you're writing a game in Fortran or dragging and dropping objects in a Unity interface, games analogize to physical space first and time second. The structure of a game like Adventure has an odd similarity to the structure of a narrative as it was laid out by Prop, but Adventure's primary axis is space. It is first and foremost a map that you can explore. The only perceptible passage of time is the player navigating the map, occasionally picking up an object. The game space itself rarely changes. Meanwhile, Prop's model of narrative is entirely dependent on time. As he notes, no story contains all of the narrative functions, but they always occur in chronological order, while their locations can vary infinitely. This happens naturally in storytelling. A story is told one way as a series of events. The story space isn't designed to be explored like a map, but read, start to finish. So how do games manage to tell stories when they behave like maps? Simply put, they have to forcibly impose a narrative onto that map. Time has to be forced onto space through the physical process of altering the space the game has created. To make this idea clearer, consider the room. Rooms, which in later games developed into levels, are the narrative teams of games. They're the units that build their narrative. And the only way in which time passes in these games is by traveling through rooms. In Adventure, for example, to continue past the first level, you'd have to pass a room with a great crack in its center, gather a magic rod in a different room, and then return to the room with the crack to wave the rod and reveal a magic bridge. Going to the room with the rod is the only way to alter the room with the bridge, which is the only way to advance the story. But again, Adventure is just barely a story. So for a more contemporary example, and one that seems to fall more squarely into what we think of as complex narrative, let's look at Adam Cadre's 905. In the game, after exiting your home, you're given the option to get into your car and drive to work. In order to continue telling the story, once you enter the car, you are now in a room simulating a car. Your options are limited to remaining in that car and getting off at one of two exits. That's not how space works. In physical space, you can turn around and go home if you want to. But that is how time works. It's an arrow. Once you're on your way to work, you are barring, you know, forgetting your laptop or an emergency or whatever, you are on your way to work. So by closing off the room you were previously in and creating a room pretending to be a car that simulates the passage of time, Cadre imposes narrative on spatial structure. This is observable in almost all games that have levels or rooms. Whether you're playing Half-Life or Mario, the passage of time and the arc of a narrative are shown by the limitation of physical space. It depends on moving around a map and then altering that map, closing off rooms or levels to tell events in sequence. Levels and rooms are used as substitutes for units of time. To impose props and error teams on a game, they have to occur in a specific place, and they can't be revisitable. Once Mario leaves the first level, he needs to go to the next castle. The princess isn't there anymore. Contemporary games tend to perform this spatiotemporal jujitsu more subtly. They add indicators to simulate the passage of time, whether it's a mission that only occurs at a certain time or the constant rise and set of the sun in a game like Red Dead Redemption. But these indicators are just window dressing. To move the central narrative of a game forward, you always have to go to the next room, find the next key, complete the next mission. And those have to be located in one place. This limitation comes from allowing users to explore the space in which a story takes place. To actually simulate space and time, time has to flow forward, while the physical space within a simulation remains accessible and changes organically. But games can't really do that and might not want to. So this is the fundamental tension at the center of games, finding the balance between an open world and telling a story, giving a game structure and giving its users a variety of ways to experience it. It's no coincidence that a lot of the games most praised for their storytelling are the games that limit their users the most, games that are on rails like The Last of Us or Firewatch. These games give the impression of an interactive movie rather than a game that really has variable content. The time that passes in these games is irreversibly tied to the space you travel while playing. Meanwhile, while open world games like Grand Theft Auto may be praised for their central storylines, one of the greatest joys of playing them is the exploration of game space. But to enjoy that exploration, you have to abandon the story and vice versa. And the more open the world, the less able a game is to have a story at all. An open universe game like No Man's Sky is little more than a galaxy scale map simulator, which Will Crowther might have enjoyed, but doesn't make for much of a narrative. But the most conte interesting contemporary games to me are the ones that embrace this limitation. Games like Gone Home or Inkle's 80 Days. 
These are games that know that they're maps and take advantage of it. Gone Home does so by offering a limited world space, literally just a house, and allowing its users to discover its narrative through objects in that space. On the other hand, 80 Days offers a quite literal map of the world for its players to explore. And by offering a map as its interface, it creates a sort of open world, but one where the story is the space and vice versa. These are two very different games, but they operate on the same assumption, one that games on rails or open world games often lack. These games know that they're maps and they're effective because of it. So that takes us back to the beginning. Narrative video games began with a single man trying to recapture a space that time had taken from him. Ever since then, that fight has continued within the design of game space itself. Time versus space, narrative versus choice. Despite the structural nature of both of their models, Vladimir Prop and Will Crowther inadvertently designed two systems that never really fit together. In my own research and game development, I'm trying to bring attention to this battle. Every game, whether it knows it or not, is a product of that conflict. But most of the best games are ones that at least know that they're fighting. Thank you.